Johnny. Okay, I'm back. This time, we're going to restore the color to this little velveteen whitetail here. Uh, I'm going to use oils. I'm also going to show that there's no one real color formula that you can use for all deer. Every animal is an individual. If you treat them as such, you're going you're gonna to produce much better work in the, in, in the end, in the long run. Uh, like I say, the paints of my choice are oils. That's what I started with. I went to an airbrush, did airbrushing for quite a few years, and went back to, I went back to my roots. I went back to oil paints. Um, I've done portraits of animals, horses, uh, pets, you know, uh, wildlife. Uh, always done in oils. Um, I've recently started using acrylics in miniature work, but for taxidermy, I like the drying time of oils. I like the way they blend much better. And um, in the final application, I think oil paints are the, are, the, are the way to go. This is just my opinion, okay? You can come up with your own. If you don't like what I do, don't follow what I do. Try it, though. See if you like it. You might just enjoy the process. It's quite relaxing. Um, you don't have the aggravation of cleaning the airbrush after every color. You use a variety of brushes, different brushes, and the cleanup is a breeze. I use uh, odorless turpentine. Uh, it's a product called Turpenoid. So my shop doesn't have uh, a harsh turpentine or a lack of thinner smell or anything like that. So, it's time to get started on this little man and get him finished. And here is my palette of colors. Literally, my palette and my colors. I've got burnt umber, burnt sienna, ivory black, Mars red, and good old titanium white. Now, these colors are used very sparingly, okay? Um, the brushes I choose are less expensive artist brushes. These are not the most expensive or finest oil painting brushes you're going to find. These are really cheapo brushes. Uh, the reason is painting is done by using stippling action, as you will see. Uh, we have a container of well, this is the terpenoid. It's in a jar. That's called the silicoil brush cleaning tank. There's a little coil of wire in here, and that helps you clean your brushes across. And I'll use that as we go. I don't do any thinning of the paints, except for perhaps some of the black and brown mix for the nictitating membrane. At any rate, Let's get some pictures up here. This is a photo of a typical white-tailed deer in winter coat, in their winter coat. <clears throat> I believe this is also a Midwestern to Northeastern uh, species of whitetail. Now what you can see in this photo is how brown it's almost a straight burnt umber. Okay, it's a, it leans towards the dark side. In the center, you have a lighter area, and that we create with a little bit of Mars Red or Burnt Sienna, depending on which color we feel is going to work best. Apart from that, we have this finer haired more early season buck and I think this is going to be closer to what I'm going to give a little velveteen deer more of a mm, light milk chocolate look again down the center we have a reddish tone in the eye channel very dark nictitating membrane nearly black I don't like to use straight black because black is not really a color in nature the surrounding hair is really 
sort of shaded out from the dark and we're going to recreate all of those effects. Here's another interesting eye. Again, this is a, I believe, a winter coat deer. And you can see his color here. Again, this is a darker phase brown. Looks almost has like it has a little purple in the color. This is the same deer with a little different eye attitude. Ah, now here's a real, oh, here we go. This is another, mm, I'd say fall. This was taken uh, during the fall. So we have, again, the lighter shade of brown surrounding the eye. Okay. Now here we have a dilly. This one here, this is a late summer, early fall deer. You can see the lightness to the brown and almost, we can almost use a touch of yellow in the very front of the channel of the eye. Ah, again, a winter deer. And this is probably an older animal. He's got quite a bit of structure over his eye, uh, quite a bit of muscle structure around his eye and he's very dark and very wide light middle section now how do you figure all this out well you have to learn how to read the skin okay it also helps when the deer come in if you photograph the animals as they come in you can photograph them and or take what's known as color notes now that's not written notes on the color of the deer, but actual, you can do watercolor, you can do oil color notations. We have here a fall deer, a heavy, heavy browed buck here. It's a heavy browed buck. See how, how hard that brow comes out from the top. And he's got a sort of a reddish cast to his brown coat, the brown skin. And it goes on and on and on like this. You, ha you need as many references as you can get from deer from all regions and deer from all seasons. A deer for all seasons. Hey, it's almost cinematic. But this is how you go about determining coloration on the deer. And this is what we're going to try to replicate. And we can do it very well. I can, I can do it very well with oils, as you'll see. Okay, enough for the lesson. Let's get to work. The first color to apply is the titanium white. I dip it in the brush. It's probably going to be out of focus, but that's all right. I dip it in the brush. Dip the brush into the paint and then I pat it out onto the palette. From there, I start applying it. I apply it to the bare skin. And then go down to the hairline. Go all around. You need to get just a little more going. Here we go. Now, I, I was going to tape off the eyelashes with painter's tape, but it really wouldn't stick to the individual hairs very well so the eyelashes will be cleaned out later of any paint that gets on them 
Now I'm going right down to the hairline and going into the hairline ever so slightly. All right. I'm going underneath the eyelid. I want to coat the tops, the, the, the upper eyelid from the underside. My big head may get in the way. I got to check this. Okay. Looking good. I'm going to get around here and apply a little more white. This is why I'm not using really fine, you know, artist brushes. Now, for the sake of the camera, I'm left-handed, but for the sake of the camera, I'm going to try to paint with my right hand. Oh, boy. <laughs> Here's where he screws up, folks. Oh. All right. No, not bad. Okay. Let's extend this down a little further. Further. Anything further, Father? Anything further, further? All right. There we go. Now, I'm going to apply the white paint just like this the opposite eye. And I'll come back and apply the brown. The next color I'm going to apply is the burnt umber. And again, I simply dip the brush into the paint. Hmm. Well, how's that? It's there some ways. There it is. I just lightly dip the brush into the paint. Tap off the excess, tap, 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 against my palette. And again, with a stippling motion, I start applying it to the areas of the bare skin of the eye. And as this is applied, it becomes blended into the white, taking the dark brown color that burnt umber is known for into a lighter shade of pale into a lighter shade of brown let's see how many of you caught that song reference alrighty and you simply add color a little bit at a time you don't want this to become overpainted a little bit at a time I may have to get in front of the camera to get back here now, let me do this. Let me get to the other side. Here we go. Hopefully, I'm not blocking the view. And I really can't tell. But we shall see what we shall see. See, see. Now, we start drawing the color down into the white that was applied onto the hair. I'm going up and I'm spreading some under the upper eyelid on its underside. Again, I'm going to go right handed. I'm going to cripple myself here. <laughs> uh, what a day, what a day, what a day. This happens to be being filmed during Aretha Franklin's memorial service and Senator John McCain's funeral day. As I'm doing this, I'm now listening to one of my heroes, Bill Clinton, speak about Miss Aretha. Now, I'm going to take a clean brush at this point, and I'm going to blend these two colors together. You see how subtle it is? It's very, very subtle. Now, I have my headlight on, my headlamp on. I'm going to blend this in. I'll blend the brown to the white. Blend it into the hair. I'm going to go all the way around. And the little bit of brown that got onto this brush from the blending process is simply going to be an assist. I just want to make sure that all the white is covered by the brown. Okay. All righty. Now, I'm going to just take my finger and wipe the paint off the glass eye. I like to keep my 
the glass eyes as clean as possible during the entire process. If you're watching this whole thing through, then you, you know that you've witnessed my insanity to that. I'm going to grab a, a scepter gold double aught brush and I'm going to take a little bit of the Mars Red. No, I'm going to take some burnt sienna. I'm going to take, yeah, a little burnt sienna. And I'm going to put it down on the inner top edge of the lower lid just to create that fleshy portion that lies down in there. And that makes a nice little contrast. Now just for toots and giggles, I'm going to take just the smallest touch of Mars Red with the same double up brush. I'm going to mix it into the burnt sienna. I'm going to wipe off some of the excess on a piece of paper towel. And I'm going to come down the center line well, I should say the center crease of the bare skin at the front of the eye. Draw a line from the corner down to the lacrimal gland. Now I'm going to take another clean brush. Oh, let's get a little softer one here. I'm going to take this brush and I'm simply going to blend it lightly and slightly. There. I'm going to look underneath the uh, upper lid. That's well covered. Very nice. All right. I like the way that looks. I like the way that looks. And you see what I mean by how subtle the appearance is. Now, I haven't even wiped any of the excess paint away yet. That'll be the next step. Simply take a piece of paper towel, put it over the tip of my finger, go along and wipe the hair. Like so. Like so. There we go. The only other thing I'll do after this begins to dry just a little bit, I'm going to go over this textured lower lid and the underside of the upper lid with a little darker brown. And that's going to take place when I darken the nictitating membrane. But for now, that's where we're at. And I'll repeat that on the opposite eye. I'm going to darken the lower lid now. I'm going to use straight burnt umber, just carefully apply it, mostly along the textured surface that I, I created, all the way up, just about up to the very midway part of the corner of the eye. Now. A little more burnt umber. Now I'm not, I'm not too worried about removing a lot of this from the brush. I want this to cover. So I'm just going to apply it straight off the little bit I applied to my palette. Like so. All right. There we go. Now, I'm going to take another brush. It's the same brush I've blended with before. 
and I'm going to gently and carefully blend this dark along its edge into the light brown. And like I said, I enjoy painting with oils. I really do. It's a lot easier to use them when you're not trying to avoid the camera lens. <laughs> But isn't that the way it always is, with the camera staring at you? Very nice. Okay. Let me get to the other side here and do the same thing. The other side's already had the burnt umber applied to the lower lid. Now I'm just going to blend it. Blend it all together. All right, there we go now. Let's continue blending. There we go. All right. Next, I'm going to I'm going to darken the nictitating membrane. I've mixed burnt umber and ivory black together, and I've added just a little bit of the thinner, the terpenoid. I'm going to come in. And I'm going to darken. Now let's add a little more thinner. Now you want this to spread really well. I'm just going to add just a little more thinner to the paint. I want it to flow. Now, the 00 Scepter brush that I use for the Mars Red, which is a very strong color, has been cleaned so that I can use it again to apply this dark color to the nictitating membrane. Okay, I'm going to use my same cleanup brush to take the dark color and just blend it off of the little bit of the front corner where it got on the lower lid. I'm just going to blend that away, blend it into the brown. All right. I don't know how well this is showing. But that color has been applied. Now I'm going to clean the glass, the glass eye. I'm going to clean that off. And here is what we have on the eye at this point. The paint was removed from the glass, and I will only wait until the paint dries before I clean the glass again with Windex. All right, I want to reduce the amount of shine that the Mod Podge texturing gave the lower lid. Uh, it's just a little too shiny for my liking. So I'm going to take some burnt umber pan pastel, and I'm simply going to touch it to that lower lid. And I'm going to take the shine away. Yes, the paint is still a little on the wet side, which is good. It will give something for the pan pastel to adhere to. This is a just a typical little makeup applicator, nothing special, not an overly specialized tool. Not if that's on there. Blow the excess away. the dulling, or I should say the flattening of the glossy shine. And that was a matte finish. That was a matte uh, Mod Podge. But it gave a, has a slick enough surface that it gave 
the lower eyelid a bit of a shine and I really didn't want. This has been done on the other lower eyelid as well already. Slightly touch it into the pastel. Touch it down to the detail. Clean it up. The shine is gone. Now I'm going to use my little cleanup brush and remove the or blend the pan pastel that got onto the brown area of the painted skin. I'm just going to reduce its impact. Just like so. I'm going to move down to the nose pad. All right, here are some references for nose pads. Now you can see on this one here, there's no lower lip showing at the bottom. They don't always show a lower lip. This gives you a nice idea of how the color is distributed. Now this is nice because it demonstrates a coloration inside the nostril. You can see how deep in the brown goes. Okay. Here's another one. Now these nostrils are flared open, but you can see how deep in the brown coloration goes. Now this one here, they're almost completely brown. Now here, this shows it beautifully from the front. There we go. So armed with all this information, it's time to tackle the nose pad. Alrighty, to start the coloring on the nose pad, I start with a mix of white, the titanium white and the Mars red. And I want a very pale color. And I want to push that down into the details between the nodules of the nose pad. So hold this still. It's just bouncing around on the on the mounting stand just a little too much. And back in the day when I started there were no mounting stands. You used to put the head mount on your workbench with the part you wanted to work on facing you and that meant you twisted yourself into a pretzel to get the coloration in all around the nose. There was no flipping it around upside down, right side up, there was none of that. Now we have mounting stands that have to be held still. <laughs> now if any of this color gets onto the little white uh, hair indents, not to worry. They will be cleaned up and they will be enhanced later with the pan pastel, my white pan pastel. That and a fine brush will fix them right up. All right, now I want to go all the way up on the nose pad with this. Now, when I reach a certain point, I'm going to grab a piece of paper towel. I'm really, really, really pressing it into the details between the nodules. I want to get it down to the bottom of the nodules. Because the next thing I do is grab a piece of paper towel and I lightly rub over the surface. removing it from the surface of the nodules. 
but keeping it down deep. Well, as deep as these are. They're not really overly deep. But I want to keep them down in that portion of the nose pad. I want to keep the, uh, the flesh tone. It's light color. Now this little buck did not have a flesh colored underside to his nose pad. Some deer do. All right, some deer do. When that's the case, you replicate that. What I want to do right now though is just remove this pink from the surface. Now while it's still upside down, I'm going to apply darker color with a softer brush. I'm going to go with black and burnt umber. Stronger on the black though. All right. I want to take a good amount of the paint off the brush. Now just start applying this to the surface nodules. There we go. Now I'm going to also darken the lower lip, the front of the lower lip. Now here's where artistic skill comes in. Like you have that light strip running up the center. Get in there with a little bit of brown and just soften it. Soften the effect of the, of the light paint. Now what you're doing basically at this juncture is touching the brush down. It's not even really stippling. Stippling is harder than this. Stippling drives the paint in like we did on around the the eyes the fleshy part of around the eyes the eyes i'm just applying paint to the top the surface of the nodules let's put it that way All right, let's. And the reason we wipe it off the surface is we don't want it to lighten the color or muddy up the color. That's why we don't, we just want it down in the crevices between the nodules. So we're really replicating what nature has provided. as seen in the reference photos. Yeah, like I say, I'm not really worried about getting paint on the little white hairs in the dimples. I'll clean those up later. That's looking pretty good right now. That's looking mighty fine. I'm going to darken just a little more. Actually, I'm going to go with burnt umber towards the bottom of the lip. I'm going to emphasize the burnt umber on the lower side of the lip here just to give it a little redder appearance not a fleshy appearance a redder appearance same thing with the lower lip you get in there with just burnt umber just on the tip of the brush this is like extraordinarily subtle. Have I mentioned how subtle this coloration is? 
it will show when the gloss coat is applied to the nose pad. I'm going to turn them over. I'm going to continue this entire operation on the upper portion of the nose pad. And here we go, repeating the lightening of the nose pad as we did on the underside, but this time on the top side. Uh, rub this in. You're massaging it, basically mas massaging it down into the base of the details. Okay. Now I'm going to continue this and I'm going to wipe it off like I did on the bottom. And there's that now. Okay. Now we're on to the dark colors again. Burnt umber and ivory black. Mixed together on the palette. I'm not looking to make it an absolutely uniform color. Brown and black shows through at different places. That's fine. I'm going to wipe some of the excess off the brush. This is almost like dry brushing in model building or model railroading. It's almost like dry brushing. With just enough paint to cover the high surfaces, the high points. Just like so. I'm going to continue with this application until I get it where I want it. Then I'll show it on camera again. And here we are. Here's where we're at at this point. around both sides. Looking good. Looking real fine. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and tone out these nostrils. I'm going to mix some brown umber with just a touch of the ivory black. And we'll go ahead and tone this down just like we showed in the just like it showed in the reference photos. Very, very, very lightly towards the front. Don't want a lot. Now I'm going to blend that. Take this little blending brush. Blend it all in. This will be enhanced with the pan pastels as well after the paint fully dries. like so. Rather nice. And there we go. And I will do the same to the opposite nostril.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and seal the uh, bare skin after it's been painted using the plaid rubber acrylic sealer in matte. And I'm going to handle it the same way I handled the fungicidal sealer. I'm going to cover the eye. Cover the eye and give it a couple of quick spritzes. I'm holding it about 8 to 10 inches back. Just a couple of quicks. Don't need a lot. Don't need a lot. Just enough. It's the next day, by the way, the oil paint has dried. There we go. And I'll get the other I'll get I'm the gonna other. wipe it off the off the hair. Don't want any of the feeler hairs glued down by this sealer spray. And the hair doesn't need it. Only the painted surfaces. I'm going to go into the nostrils. The nose pad. Nostrils on the other side. Now I'm going to wipe it off the hair. There we go. I'm going to let this set. And then we're going to do some of the additional toning with the um, pan pastels. The pan pastel color that I used earlier, uh, I thought was burnt umber, is actually red iron oxide extra dark. Uh, looks like it's number 23801. But that's this here. Okay. There we go. Okay, I'm going to take the pan pastel. It's broken up because it actually fell and kind of shattered its panness. But I'm going to get in here. I'm going to go over. I'm going to blend all this in. Just like so. Apply it with this brush. I'm going to blend it with another brush. I'm just going to break it up just a little bit. Like so. Let's get it done on both sides. Now, because this is a little on the red side, I'm going to add some black. There we go. A little bit of black over the brown, actually over the oxide, which is a rust, even though it's dark. This will make it just a little darker, where it should be darkened now that's done I'm going to seal it a couple of shots a couple of light shots 
of the spray. Off the hair. And there we go. And there we are. Okay, this neutral gray tint is close to white. Now you really don't want to use an actual white so this neutral gray tint is going to work beautifully. See? Okay, here we go. We dip the makeup applicator into the pan pastel. Rub it in. blow off the excess. Now it does not look painted. I'm going to do this along the lower jaw. blow off the excess. What's nice about this is you can place it right where you want it. Like so. And really press it in. And yet the excess will come off. A little puff of air. And once that's done I'll give it a little shot with the sealer and lock the powder in place. And go down the hair all the way on the chin, all the way back. This has a great ability <coughs> to tone everything together tone it all off. Any place the hair may be a little a little shy, a little short, this pan pastel really does a number. On balancing out the color. It really is magic dust. I'm going to give it a little shot. Not a lot. I just want to lock this in place. Now I've got my hand blocking the spray from hitting the glass eyes. That's it. That's all you need. That's it. That's all she wrote. Now that everything is dry, I get in here with this short end of the Kemper Tools brush and brush the paint and covering off the nostril hairs. <sighs> there we go. I actually, I don't, I've done it to the, the other side first. Just back and forth. This is the little mascara like brush. Cleans the hairs real nice. <sighs> Makes them stand out against the rest of the coloration. Now, using some Hydro Mist Gloss Top Coat. This is a 
acrylic product acrylic glosses cover much better than lacquers I'm gonna go in along the top edge of the inside of the lower eyelid like so there we are and I extend that up onto the nictitating membrane I'm just going to come a little bit forward, a little wet the corner of the eye, and now come forward just a bit. Take my finger, press against it, just to get the excess shine off, so that it has a, a damp look. Repeat on the other eye. The head is turned upside down, and the gloss applied to the underside of the upper lid. Okay, now we're going to start applying the gloss to the underside of the nose pad. And it'll start bringing out the subtle subtlety of the paint job that was done under here. Remember, it was covered with burnt umber. The burnt umber was added to the underside and you can see that starting to pop out a little now it's time to turn them right side up I did along the lower front of the lower lip hit that again there we go I want it nice and wet at the juncture of the lower lip and the underside of the nose pad all right now I'm going to gloss the top like so I want I want I like a nice wet look to the nose pad I don't want the paint to run I don't want to cause runs and drips no runs no drips no errors but I do like a nice moist nose pad you know live deer seem to be forever bringing their tongue up and licking their nose pad Maybe like they like they like the saltiness of their the moisture of the nose pad. I don't know. I know it's it has a salty taste to it. I've actually gone and kissed the deer on the on the tip of the nose. So yes, I know it's a little it's a little salty. And if they like salt licks, they like to lick their own nose. <laughs> I'm gonna go in the nostrils. I'm gonna bring some of the gloss out onto the edge. Of the nostril again on a live deer the opening of the nostrils is on the wet side and I'm going to reach in and I'm going to apply gloss deep into the nostrils and work that towards the opening and carefully bring some of that wet forward and out of the nostrils onto the edges of the nostrils I will control that with my finger pressure in just a minute reduce the shine just ever so slightly pressing with a paper towel like so you, know, you don't you don't want the gloss running out of the nose but you do want it there and as can be seen brings the color out really well brings the color out nicely 
So here we have the finished nose and nostril interiors. Very nicely done. Very nicely done. There we go. And I think we have a well finished head. Very nicely done. Just a little more cleaning to do on the eyes. And then it'll be time to put the felt on the back of the deer. Well, the velvet restoration on a little friend here is complete. And now is the time for me to uh, finish the deer off and get him ready to go home with the client. Um, what I'm gonna do now He's going to come off the stand, the mounting stand. He's going to go into a little cradle I threw together for him, and felt will be applied to the back. So I'm going to get started. I'll get my little man finished here. What I've got here is a cardboard cutout that was made on the back of the head form before uh, the form was secured to the mounting, mounting stand. Now, even though it says CC100, Matuska is the brand, CC100, up, left turn, okay? Whether it's left turn, right turn, or straight, in the 100 series of forms, the back, the shape of the back of the head form will be the same for all three. And then from the 200, all the way up through the CC series of semi-uprights, okay? One pattern is all you need for straight, left, and right but of course you need them for the different sizes so you only need one pattern for all the different sizes but only one pattern per form doesn't matter if it's straight left or right the back of the of the head form the backboard pattern is the same and only requires one cardboard cutout this is the black felt that's going to be used I buy it by the yard from Joanne Fabrics. This is a good, uh, a good sturdy felt. This will be glued to the back. This is barge cement. It's a rubber cement. This is the, the original formula of barge cement. This contains the, the tuline, which uh, they have it uh, without tuline, but it doesn't seem to have the holding strength of the original barge cement. You know it's the original the color of the cans or the tubes that you use are yellow and red. The color of the tuline free or toluene free is, I believe, blue and, blue and yellow or blue and white. But this is the strong stuff. Uh, fumes are real, real strong. But this is what I prefer to attach the felt to the back of the head. The cardboard pattern is laid on the felt. And an initial amount of felt is cut away from the main body of felt, I like to use a curved tip scissors. And this just takes it away from the felt. You notice it has IN, that's the inside, that's facing up. The pattern will be traced with the inside, which is what attaches to the backboard of the head form. It will be traced out the same way. I use a watercolor pencil, you could use crayon pencil, it doesn't matter, as long as it's lighter color than the felt. And I start by going around the edge of the cardboard pattern with the light colored pencil. I hold the cardboard down along the edge so that pressure from the pencil does not pull the felt out from under the cardboard. If you do that, then your pattern is not going to be true. And I go, all, I go all the way around until it's complete. Now that the pattern is completely traced out, I move it over. I don't know how well the pattern... Oh, it is showing up on camera. I can see it. 
Now, I mark an eye on the inside, or I should say on the felt that's pointing up so that it matches the cardboard pattern. This is the inside. This is what was against the backboard when it was traced out. This is the inside. This will be glued against the backboard. Now I start cutting with the scissor. I go all the way around. I, I put the curved tip of the scissor outward. I don't, cur I don't cut with the curve facing in. This allows me to be, uh, be more exacting in my cuts. And I will cut this all the way around. Okay, the buck has been laid in the cradle. There's also a towel laid over the piece of heavy cloth. That just further protects the hair from hitting the metal. Uh, his nose is supported with a towel on top of a little container that's on a stool. Normally, I would lay the antlers against the table, but in the case of this little velvet set, that's not going to happen. Now, there's actually a brush in the lid of the can, and that's what I use. First, I use a pliers to open said can. Yes, it is a contact cement, and yes, it does cement the lid in place. And there's the magic glue. Ooh. Magic I actually glue. like to start near the edge. And what I do is lift the hair. Even though this is very short, I lift the hair away from the edge of the wood while applying the glue. And I do this all the way around. Even though this is a short-haired deer, it's good practice to keep the hair away from the edge because the majority of deer I take in are not as short-haired as this little fella. Most of them are long-haired. So it's a good practice to keep the hair out of the way of the glue. Now, this first layer is allowed to dry. This will be allowed to dry. And Another thin layer will be applied to the felt. This is contact cement. It works best if both parts to be joined have the cement applied to them. I've had people ask, have I ever given thought to using a 3M77 adhesive spray? Yes, I have. In fact, I've used it in the past. I do prefer this method for the main reason that the control of where the adhesive applies is more important than being able to do it quickly. Um, you really cannot keep the spray. It's very, I mean, you can, but it's very difficult to keep the spray out of the hair when applying it to the backboard or the back side of the mount, as opposed to brushing it on. Now I get all, I make sure the edges are completely covered to match what I put on the backboard of the deer mount. Then I go to the center. And again, I let this dry before applying it. The contact cement will dry and adhere to its brethren contact cement surface. Okay? That's the way this product works. Now that both sides have dried, I go along and I take the modeling tool first. And what I do is I roll the felt up on itself like so. 
I get in here, lightly line things up. Set the bottom in place first, like so. And I get the hairs out from underneath. I don't want to, I don't want to trap the hairs if I can at all avoid it. Like so. And now I just simply start laying the felt down onto the back of the deer head. Now this one here, I may have to trim it back a little bit. If I do, that's not a problem. That's okay. Yeah, I'm going to trim the felt back just, just a shade, especially along the sides and on the top. You see, I want the hair to lay down on the felt. So I'm going to trim this part away. Curve scissor time again. Now I can take the modeling tool, lift the hair, place this down tight, and the hair will cover the felt. Say having the pattern is just is 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 good for a guide. That will help guide you where you want to go. Yeah, this is definitely old school, but you know what? So am I. And this is the one of the things that my clients do enjoy about my work. Yeah, takes a little bit of time, but you know what? That's not as important to me as the end results for my clients. And because they get the kind of quality work they get from me, it's one of the reasons I call them clients and not just customers. I'm going to continue trimming and laying it down. My thinking is that if you consider yourself a professional, You can call your the people who hire you to preserve their trophies, their memories. If you're a professional, you can refer to them as a client. Lawyers refer to their customers as clients. Now this little roller, little rubber roller, it's a brayer. They use this in silk screening and all kind of other art applications. I use it here to make sure that the felt is in nice tight contact with the back with the backboard on the deer head. Now I'm going to let the glue set and then I'll be attaching the hanger. And that will be this hanger here from McKenzie. I use three size six by one and five eighths screws to attach the hanger to the back of the deer. The holes are pre-drilled. I, I do a final hand tightening with a handheld screwdriver, Phillips head screwdriver. was pre-drilled. There we go. There we are. There's less chance 
of stripping the hole by doing the final tighten down with a handheld Phillips head screwdriver. Now that hanger has got good slots, it has good shape, and it holds tight to the wall. There you go, little man. And just like that, the little man is finished. Felt it on the back, hanger, restored velvet. He looks swell. Ready for his, ready for his portfolio shots. Or he's ready for the camera, Mr. DeMille. <laughs>